I once was in a, in a squad car. We got a major 415 with knives and chains. That's a gang fight. And we went flying into this thing. You know what it was? And everybody, when, when they hit the scene, their adrenaline was pumping. Everybody had their gun out. You know, we thought we were going into a gang fight. It was two old men arguing over a garden hose. Today, Stephen J. Cannell is back to tell us about his new novel, The Three Shirt Deal. There's corruption in the LAPD. And he'll tell us about his new movie, The A-Team. Great to have you back Greg, again today, great Stephen. Great to be back with you. It's been a while. It, well, it's been, uh, what, a year? <laughs> we, we took a year off. Took we, a year we off. We took a, a we book off. Now. I missed you last year. And I have some secret information about you. Uh-oh. I was talking to my friend Joanne Barron the other day, and um, the acting coach and actress. Right. And I was at her master class here in Santa Monica. And I said, you know, because I told her I was going to be interviewing you. And I said, you know, he used to always end his shows with the typewriter. And I said, well, you know, these days with computers, what does he do? She said that she called you or talked to your daughter in Hawaii. You were in the penthouse in Hawaii. You got that Hawaiian tan today. Yeah. And you had the typewriter shipped to you in Hawaii is what she told well, me. Well, I actually still write on a Selectric because, you know, I have learning disabilities. I have mm -hmm. severe dyslexia. And so spell check doesn't work for me. And, oh. you know, because every other word I, is misspelled. So when I hit the spell checker on my computer, it just smokes. Okay. So, so that's for me, you know, I just stayed on the Selectric, and I've got like 40 of these things. 40? Yeah, because so I figure, you know. You keep an IBM in the typewriter business. I, and I've, so and I've got years. a guy that fixes them for me, and, and uh, so when they, when they, you know, there's 3,000 moving parts on a Selectric type, typewriter. It's amazing. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I take them. I usually take two, so I have a backup if one if one breaks. So it's in the luggage with you or something. Well, or well yeah, I mean, it's what's well, not. My, you can't put them in the luggage. Right. I take it separately and okay. packed in in foam and all of that. But yeah. Well, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, don't be. It's uh, it's sort of silly, but you know, I, I should be writing on a computer. But there's something very old school about exactly hearing that ball hit the page, and I love doing it. I love I love writing. So, would it, even without the dyslexia, would you still you think use a typewriter? Because you just sound old school with it. I mean, is that well? Is it you know, it is. A, it is the dyslexia, and it also is. The, it suits my writing process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really like to write five or six pages, then sit back with my feet on my desk and a pencil in my hand and do a, a pencil edit, read it, mm -hmm. read it over. And this is my rough draft, which is all misspelled because it's all spelled phonetically uh -huh. because of my learning differences, and then send it into my secretary. Then I go back and I write another five pages. And then I sit up and I, I'm with my feet on the desk and I do a pencil edit on that and send that in. So if I can write like 15 pages a day, okay. and, and, and I like that to do it that way. And if I, if I do it on a computer and I put that cursor in and start to do my rewrite, I'm so fast on a keyboard, all of a sudden I'm doing my second draft right on top of my first draft. Uh, and I don't want to so do So you can't that. refer back, it's just gone. I, I really rather, yeah, I just really rather have the first draft, do the pencil edit, send it in. It's basically a first draft. Then look at it tomorrow and see what did I do and then do a, a second draft on it tomorrow. So okay. that's, uh, that's well, my process. Well, uh, scholars and historians will love you because they keep saying that, you know, so many modern writers these days, they'll, you know how they like to go through and look at all their drafts and versions of things. For a lot of writers these days, they, they won't even have that luxury because with the computer, there is only one version in effect for a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, unless you save it. Right. You know, yeah, so which, the other thing so I found when I was, when I ran my television studio and I had six shows on there and had all these writers working for me, and I would give some notes to a writer and I'd say, you know, this, this character, I, I'm not feeling his heart. I, you know, we need to get a little more sensitivity. And so they'd find a scene, open it up, put in six lines of sensitivity, and close it again, <laughs> and that would be it. That would be the rewrite. And i go, no, 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 no. It's got to, like, in, in, inundate his character all the way from the beginning through the end of the material. you got a lot of rewriting to do here. You can just open this up and put six lines in, you know. And, and that's what I think in, people that are writing on computers have a tendency because it's so simple. To, to, to mess with the stuff and move stuff around and everything like that. Whereas sometimes when you give a note like that, what you're really saying is I need a little bit here, a little bit here, all through the script, mm -hmm. you know? So it's so not just exactly not just that. The other thing that impresses me about you is just your work ethic. I mean, you could be retired, you don't have to be doing this, but you're up every morning at what, 5 a.m. still, right? No, it's right? a little earlier than 5, five right. How early? Well, I get up about 3.30. 3.30? And I lift for an hour. Because I, 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 oh, so you go to the gym first. I, I have a gym in my basement, and okay. I go down there, and okay. I, I crank it off for like an hour, really a hard workout. Oh. And then I, I go up to my office, and I read yesterday's pages, and I'm usually at, starting new work by 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. 5.30, something like that. And 
What, what time do you finish then? What time are you? Oh, about eleven, eleven thirty. Eleven, 11 okay. you know, and then I'm and then I'm into the office, and I'm usually have a business meeting. Mm. Go on. You know, I'm making it. movies, and I'm doing other things as well as writing novels, and and so yeah. You know, what, what time do you go to bed then? If you're getting up at three thirty. Well, my wife would tell you too early, you know, but uh, <laughs> you know, I I, I I I go to bed around nine thirty, ten o'clock. Nine thirty. Okay. Like three thirty. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Okay, I guess that's what it takes to. Well, it's what it was my, you know, what I don't, I don't recommend that for other people. Uh, but, but you really do. I mean, that's the reason. I mean, you've written so many books, TV shows. I mean, you wrote everything. I, the volume, your, the volume alone of what you've done over the years is just incredible. But it's, I guess, because of that work ethic. I mean, you have to treat it like a job, a nine-to-five job. And well, you know what? It's, even, it's <laughs> even more, more than that, Greg. You know, it's the joy, the joy that I get doing it is I cannot explain to you how much fun it is for me. So you're happy to get oh, up at 3.30. I love it. It's the best part of my day. It's one of the reasons I keep, I mean, my wife keeps saying, you know, you, are you getting up already? You know, I, sometimes I, <laughs> I like have to lay in bed until 4 so that she won't be mad at me, you know. But, <laughs> you know, but because I do, I get up, because it, I wake up and I'm like, I'm pumped to get going. And, um, you know, so it's, it, you know, it's, for me it's been, a, it's been a joy. So it isn't, I don't drag myself to the typewriter. I'm not one of those writers who loves to be interrupted. Uh, I have friends where you call them up, they're writers, and, and he said, I, and I interrupt your writing, that's ah, okay, it's okay, it's okay, you know. <laughs> I'm not that way. I, when I pick up the phone, if you call me during my writing hours, I, I answer like this, what? <laughs> <laughs> Don't call when I mean, writing, that's because you know. I'm really protecting that time, because I really, it's my most important time of my day. So are you, you're doing, what, about a novel a year now? Is it? Uh, yeah, and this year, two. Two? When, yeah. When's the next one? Uh, July. Can you tell me what the next one is? Uh, it's called At First Sight. And uh, it's a standalone. It's not a Shane Scully. It's a standalone okay, okay. novel, and it's a very different piece of work. Okay. Well, will you send me that one? I'm looking. Forward I will. To that I'll one. send it to you. Okay. Great. Now, this one, your your main guy is a, a Shane Scully, the LAPD officer. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious. I just interviewed a police officer last night, by the way, and I'm I'm not anti police, but of course, doing this sort of a thing, you hear all kinds of things about the police, and you you sort of have that. I mean, on the one hand, your main character is a police officer, <clears throat> but yet you talk a lot about police corruption or internal politics and everything. What's your... What's my take on cops? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> LAPD or cops in general? You know, know. I, I'm, I'm very pro-police. Hmm. And I've spent a lot of time in the backs of police cars. And that hmm. isn't to say... Now arrested or... No, 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 no. <laughs> well, I mean, when I was a kid, I got, I got popped a couple of times. Uh. But, you know, it, 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 you know I, I, I do ride-alongs. And, and, and before I write, like I, I did a book on the Anti-Terrorist Bureau of the LAPD. So I yep. wanted to get into ATB before I... I, I did that book, and uh -huh. it took me forever to convince them that I w that I was okay to, to go in there. <laughs> That's what I wondered if yeah, they because, liked because because obviously the last thing they want is a writer in the Anti Terrorist Bureau, <laughs> you know. But uh, they, I finally got in, and I rode around in the suburbans with those guys, and I, I got a chance to. And it's it, it's an interesting thing, you know. There's there's two sides of it. There mm -hmm. there are, you know, there are there are some cops that are drawn to police work because they love the action. Mm -hmm. You know, they love the dust-ups. They love, they love getting into it. The, maybe the drama. I don't know. And, you know, and, and there are some cops that are that are drawn to the violence. Hmm. You know, and 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 so, but they aren't. I would say the majority of the people operating on the LAPD. Who knows what motivates somebody to to want to do that kind of work? I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why people do it. Sure. My own feeling is is that if you're in a in a uh, in a squad car and you get a um, a major call, a red light and siren call, uh, you know, um, officer needs help, shot fired, or officer down yep. call, which I, I've been in squad cars where, where we got that call. Really? And, uh, and, and you're flying to this scene, and you're, it's code three, which means red light and siren. You're breaking red lights on the city streets. You're going 80 miles an hour. You know, it's a white knuckle flight. And you hit the scene, and you pile out, you don't know who's what, where, what, you know, you don't know who made the call, you don't know where the heavies are, you don't know where, if there even are heavies there. We went, I once was in a, in a squad car, we got a major 415 with knives and chains. That's a gang fight. And we went flying into this thing, you know what it was? And everybody, when, when they hit the scene, their adrenaline was pumping, everybody had their gun out, you know, we thought we were going into a gang fight. It was two old men arguing over a garden hose. <laughs> And, and, you know, the call just got fumbled by, 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 the, wow. by the... He could have got shot with a guard. Somebody could have got <laughs> shot, you know. So, you know, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, my heart was going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, like that, you know, because... So are you, no offense, but are you hiding behind the back seat or are you no, looking no, no, at you, you know, you have to kind of know what to do when you're in a police car because if you're in an important situation, you've got to bail out of the car because squad cars draw fire. Hmm. 
And so do they would just let you out or you'd jump out or well, something? Well, you, know, you basically sign a waiver, you know, and then oh. they, they, they say, I once got into a shooting in Rampart, and I, I, was, I testified at the shooting review board. Mm. It, it's a fascinating thing because these guys will hit, hit a scene like this, and now they have to make split-second se life-or-death decisions in the field that are going to be argued in court right. for like two months. And if they're wrong, they can go to jail, these, you know. And so, and then on the other side of the issue, you have the victims, people who are maybe, you know, um, injured or in some way um, uh, misrepresented by the law. Right. And, and, and you know, and, and they got a good beef too. So you know, it's a, it, it, you know, you're 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 dealing with a very difficult situation. And but it, but where do I come out? I really come out that it's a, it's one of the toughest jobs that somebody can sign up for. And, um, and the good cops, and I know a lot of really good cops who really go out of their way, you know, to make sure it's done right and, and to protect the public, regardless of where that public is, whether it's in, in, in South Central, whether it's in Rampart Division, or whether it's in Beverly Hills. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll pick up on that in just a second. We'll be right back. And we are back with Stephen J. Cannell today talking about his new novel, Three Shirt Deal, The Three Shirt Deal. So in this book, um, your cop is the good guy. Yeah, he's, you know, he's, he's, he, he is a, a little bit of a walk alone, this guy, and, and so which makes him fun. And he's married to, his wife Alexa runs the Detective uh, Services Bureau of the LAPD, so she's in charge of the entire detective division. Uh -huh. So he works for his wife, which creates an interesting kind of, um, dynamic in the book, yeah. in all the books. Um, and in this particular novel, he's approached by uh, a, a, an internal affairs detective, a woman named Cicada Yavar, a Hispanic woman, a really beautiful gal. Mm -hmm. And she approaches him, and, and internal affairs is charged or tasked with the job of, of investigating bad due process cases. Uh -huh. if, if you were arrested, sent to prison, and you claim that your case was not adequately investigated and you complain, then that complaint I'd be can, complaining. You would be <laughs> complaining. That, that would go to Internal Affairs and they investigate the investigation. And, and, and that's called a bad due process case because you're, you were denied your due process under the law. And so that's what this is. And this guy who was accused of, and, and convicted of killing his mother for two hundred dollars to buy crystal meth. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a tweaker murder. It's you know he's a you know he's when a I loser. lived in Chicago, there was a case in the news. True story. Um, kids killed their grandmother for twenty dollars for drugs. So two hundred dollars. It's probably it's got a, more a, than, a, more a, than upscale than crime. Yeah. You know, from where you live. <laughs> and, and so he, he ends up getting into this thing. And it, and this this. Tweaker murder, you know, actually is hiding a huge corruption inside the LAPD that stretches from the mayor's office to the West Side power brokers in, in Beverly Hills, and and involves a, an old enemy of Shane's who is on the LAPD, who's a head of the detective division in Van Nuys. He runs the detective bureau in Van Nuys, and and he is. Uh, a real bad guy, and Shane now, knows now he's a bad based guy. Based on all your your ride-alongs and your dealings with the, the police, is is this based on? I mean, is it just kind of a general compilation or something I, specific? I picked it or? up from two cases that oh. actually happened. Really, uh, and then I, I I I adjusted it and fictionalized it. One was a, a, a case a guy named Bruce Lisker, hmm. who was accused of killing his mother for two hundred dollars to buy meth, hmm. and and claims that that he was framed by the LAPD. Hmm. And uh, was he? Uh, maybe. I mean, there's a big. I mean, if you go onto the internet and look him up, you're going to see there's a. You know, he. I think he's currently just been granted a new trial. Oh, so he's still in prison. He's in jail. Yeah. In jail. But but the Internal Affairs Division has been investigating it, investigating the police, you know, investigation. And uh, whether he was framed or not, or whether they just jumped on him because he looked like a good suspect, and he was. He was a tweaker, and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't all there, and he, he copped, he copped to it to get out of what he thought was going to be a death penalty situation. Right. And, and you kind of talk about some of the shortcomings of even not just the police, but sort of the legal system in general, where there are those kind of, you know, it will take the police so you don't face the death. You know, if somebody doesn't have a lot of money or has a public defender, and yeah, you can and get and kind and of railroaded by the, the PD's system. office. Their their job is to get rid of these cases. 
you know, there, there are thousands of them going through the system, and so if you can pre, uh, plea bargain a case off, this guy cops to a first degree, you know, murder case, uh, a 25 to life murder case, so he could be out in 17 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like okay, that's done. It's 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 out of the system now. We can nice move, on and the and move on to the next case. And in fact, he probably sh he claims he shouldn't have ever been even arrested. So, well, what's the other case this was based on? The other case, I was fascinated when I remember the guy here in L.A. not too long ago that crashed the million dollar Enzo Ferrari. Yes. Yeah. yeah. On PCH. On PCH. Cut it in half. It, and walked away, which is a pretty good ad for the Enzo Ferrari, by the way, because <laughs> he was doing 115 or something when he rolled it. Yeah. And and when the CHP or whoever, was, I think it was the Sheriff's Department, when they were investigating this case, you know, and he's still, he, this guy just gets out of the car and he's standing on the roadside and he's making cell phone calls and he's three sheets to the wind, he's just drunk. And, and, and he has a badge in his wallet, wallet and, he, and he badges these guys and he says he's a police officer with the with a little bus company transit authority and that he works with Homeland Security. And the cops there were going, this oh, is, is a, in, a, in the real case, And this happened. is the real case. Okay, because that happens in the book, but in yeah, the real I, case. Yeah, that's why okay. I borrowed it. You yeah. know, I mean, and, and the cops are going, oh, he's a brother officer, you know, so, you know, we'll, we'll release him on his own recognizance. He blew a, a, a number on the, on the breathalyzer and everything. But, and then two other guys show up, and they have these same bus company badges. And I'm, think, I'm reading this story, and I'm thinking, what kind of police power does <laughs> Does a bus company cop, a private, you and I could form a bus company and then we could form a police department. Let's do have, it. I kind of like badges this idea. <laughs> and run around with guns and badges and we, ha and we actually would have police power. And get money from Homeland Security in you, the book. And really. <laughs> so I, I got very interested in that. And, 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 and I decided I would, I would weave that into my story. Do you know, now I know what the angle was in the book, but what was the angle in real life? Was I, there, was I there anything? The, the angle in the book. Uh -huh is my take on what was really going oh, on. Oh, so you think there was something I, I kind can't of shady? Prove it. I can't okay, prove it. Okay. But that's my take on what I think was going on. Okay. <laughs> well, now also talking about the book though, there's another twist to this. Um, as I say with your, your tan here, you look like you just came back from St. Bart's. But, um, I did. Oh, you, that's right, you did, yeah. <laughs> I just was and, back a day ago. And you, so you must like it a lot there. I, you know, I, I go there every year after my book tour. Uh, mm -hmm. After a month on the road, my wife and I you know, escape to that island, which I really like, and we've been doing it for years. And that's where this book idea kind of came from. Part of it came from there. I met a, a friend of mine on the beach that I've known all over the years that, that stays at the same uh, resort that we do and comes every, every year at the same time. And he and I were talking on the beach, and he told me some very interesting things about a carton manufacturing company that I, I used in this novel. And that does, I don't, I guess, well, am I giving away too much? Should I? No, no, it's okay. okay. I mean, because on, on the one hand, no, you may think carton manufacturing, that doesn't sound very interesting. But what, what is interesting well, about it? Well, it's the million dollar prize scrape offs that, you know, right. the, that, that were, where if you have a package and, and you sell it to somebody and they, and they, and they know that there's a contest, he scrapes it off and, oh my gosh, I won, I, I got the winning number. I can collect this from the, from the product manufacturer for a million dollars, and uh, or get a new Hummer or whatever the prize <laughs> is. So, um, you and know, he, that's that's kind of what's it's it's a piece of this novel. And he, so there's a whole system they have for like verifying that people yeah. number one actually win the prizes because people yeah. may think that it's just a gimmick or a publicity stunt. They don't really give away the money. And right, no, it's so. it's uh, it, it's it's a very it, what was interesting about it was what how much I didn't know about it. Yeah. So when this guy is telling me all this stuff, which I I won't give away here, but it's fascinating the way, and it really affects this whole murder mystery of this novel. Do you think this kind of thing could happen in real life, or has happened, without giving uh, away too much? But w w well, I think there is a, there certainly is the possibility to rip off one of these prize contests, mm. and I and I really think that um, one of the reasons that they go to all the trouble that they go to to try and protect the integrity of the contest is because they probably have been ripped off. Has anybody Just told me of a ripoff? No, because they're keep, it quiet. You know, keep it quiet. But I mean, they, they certainly do go to a lot of trouble to protect the integrity of their contest. We will be right back. And we are back with Stephen J. Candle talking about his book, The Three Shirt Deal. Well, so I asked you what you thought about the police. What do the police think about you? I think they're in generally they like me. I, I, I seem to get a lot of cooperation from them, and they and, still let you ride along and, and all you that. You know, yeah, and 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 the other thing too is that in, in my books, the police, the good police, always prevail. And if there are, they aren't always bad police. Sometimes there are in the novel, but 
but um, but I, but frequently the you know the the story doesn't revolve around police corruption. Right. Happens to, in this case that there is one guy in the Van Nuys department that's really a bad guy. I guess after training day in movies like that, you know, yeah, what can they yeah. do? I mean, you know, it's just out there. So <laughs> well, that was the uh, rough. That was the. Um, um, uh, what is it? Who was it? What was the name of the guy? Uh, Perez. That was Rafael Perez. Mm. That was the story of Rafael Perez, who, you know, was was a bad guy and and part of the Rampart scandal. And that whole Training Day story was about the the Rampart scandal. Was based on the Rampart scandal. Well, you also have, besides your novels and all the TV shows you've done, you have a movie coming out now based on one of the TV shows. Old TV shows. We're doing it out of 20th Century Fox. Mm. John Singleton is directing it. It's the A Team. The A Team. Be a big summer movie, and um, we're excited about John having John part of it, and uh, and and where we're going with it with the project. And there's a rumor that Woody Harrelson may be among. Well, the you know what? I've been out of town, and and that was definitely in the in the making when I left, and I haven't talked to John since I got back, so I'll find out. I don't want to. To, to break bad news here, but. <laughs> <laughs> and but the general idea is, I think I saw on IMDb that it's like the a group of Iraqi war. I mean, soldiers coming home from Iraq or something. Yeah, we've just updated it from Vietnam, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, to, to to Iraq. And uh, but it 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 basically ha deals in, in the same uh, venue. The characters, it's a it's a comedy drama. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the A Team, it's not quite as cartoony maybe as the A Team series was. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a little more uh, what we would call verisimilitude or the appearance of truth. Nice big uh, budget summer action. Yeah, film. big budget movie. Big budget. Huh? You know, I, I don't I don't see this being being made for much less than a hundred. You know, oh. so. And um, any release date yet? Um, you know, not summer? really at this point. I, I, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll have it in the theaters within a year, but but it might be a little bit longer than that, depending on what the post-production schedule is. And will we be seeing any cameos from Mr. T or Dirk well, Benedict or any of those guys? I, 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 always I always love to do that, but you know, and again, I haven't talked to John about it. Um, the, the thing is that some directors love to do that and think it's a great salute to the show mm -hmm. and that audiences really like, like it. it yeah. And other directors feel that it's cheesy and that it doesn't work and everything. So, I mean, if 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 I and and I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer to that. You know, if I were going to be in total charge of that decision, I would love to put them in simply because they're all friends of mine. And uh, but we'll see. see okay, we'll stay tuned on that. And of course, as I say, you've done so many shows over the years. I mean, think of Twenty One Jump Street, Johnny Depp. I guess really you launched his career. Well, come on. I mean, you know, John, I mean, I, I gave him his first big job, but Johnny was, if I hadn't been around, he would have made it without me, believe me. That guy was major talent. Uh, we're doing that out at Sony Pictures, by the way, as a movie. Oh, you're 21 Jump Street yeah, is going to be a movie, Yeah, and I'm too? doing uh, The Greatest American Hero through my own studio. Re so you've got three movies three in the Three of them right from now. the old series, and then one of my novels I'm doing as a movie, too, so. Now, I have to ask you, another one of your shows was Beretta. Beretta. With Robert Blake. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on... That situation. You want to drag me into that <laughs> sewer, Greg? <You're> well, <laughs> I just wonder. I well, okay. I was on court TV a lot during that trial because I couldn't, for the life of me, believe that Robert had committed that crime. I, I've known him. Meaning, you couldn't believe that he did it, or you don't believe he did it. I, I don't believe he did it. Don't I don't believe, believe he, did he did it because he's look. He's a he's a really smart guy, and that was a murder committed by an idiot. And and, and I cannot believe that Robert Blake, if he was going to kill her. His alibi for the a moment of the murder would be to say, I ran across the street to get my gun out of a restaurant. I mean, that's about as stupid an alibi as you could come up with. And then on top of that, if, if he was going to do it, he would have been in Vancouver. He would have been in Berlin. He wouldn't have been anywhere near the murder. Get on the plane like OJ? Uh, he would have not been, yeah, he would have not been around. And, and the, you know, the, it, it's just, I've known Robert for so long, he, 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 he sort of got in, into this trouble, I think, because he loved to sort of talk tough, and mm. he, he, he would, he, I could easily hear him saying, you know, we ought to whack this broad, you know, I can hear him say, you know, that, that doesn't mean he was ever going to do Does it. Does the writer and you have a scenario for what could have really happened? Have you ever thought about that? Uh, yeah, I got, a, I, got a, I got a theory for what happened. Is it going to be a book, or can you tell me? No, no, I, don't, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to write about it, but I, <laughs> since I have no proof, I, I don't want to imply. Something uh, I'll tell you off camera, but yeah. Okay, well, you know, but looking forward to after the show this time. Well, I, you know, the other thing that's interesting about you that you just don't hear these days when I was reading about your book, um, you claim you had a happy childhood. I did. And these days, I mean, you're supposed to say you were abused as a child. Either the priest did it, your parents did it, sorry to say that, but I mean, you actually had a happy childhood. Does yeah, anybody my, my have My parents a stayed married the, my, the, until they died, and 
you know, my, my, my dad was my biggest hero in life. I, if, if I could be like him, I, I, I would have accomplished my greatest goal. Um, you know, I, I say that kind of jokingly, but I'm also serious. So, I mean, these days we kind of have the notion that like everything's dysfunctional. I mean, every family's dysfunctional, every person's dysfunctional. Do you believe that or not? I mean, it sounds like you came from I a very different that. background. I don't believe I've been married for 43 years to my wife. All, all three of my children have grown up straight and true. Mm -hmm. All very, you know, are, are out in the business world working hard get, and making it in, in, in life. Um, and, and don't use drugs and aren't, aren't beaten around and aren't bumming money off people. I mean, I think, but my wife and I also raised them firsthand. We didn't have nannies, we didn't have drivers, we didn't have assistants, we took care of them ourselves, and we invested in them, and, and uh, you know, and we stayed married, so we, we created a, a, a very um, solid platform for them. Well, thank you very much for being here today, Stephen. Right, I appreciate you. it. Always a pleasure. Stephen J. Candle, his new book is Three Shirt Deal. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.